Chapter 17 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot, recorded for LibriVox by Josh Middledorf. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 17 Shadows of the Coming Race. My friend Trost, who is no optimist as to the state of the universe hitherto, but is confident that at some future period, within the duration of the solar system, ours will be the best of all possible worlds, a hope which I always honor as a sign of beneficent qualities. My friend Trost always tries to keep up my spirits under the sight of the extremely unpleasant and disfiguring work by which many of my fellow creatures have to get their bread, with the assurance that all this will soon be done by machinery. But he sometimes neutralizes the consolation by extending it over so large an area of human labor and insisting so impressively on the quantity of energy which will thus be set free for loftier purposes that I am tempted to desire an occasional famine of intervention in the coming ages lest the humbler kinds of work should be entirely nullified while there are still left some men and women who are not fit for the highest, especially when one considers the perfunctory way in which some of the most exalted tasks are already executed by those who were understood to be educated for them, there rises a fearful vision of the human race evolving machinery which will, by and by, throw itself fatally out of work. When in the Bank of England I see a wondrously delicate machine for testing sovereigns, a shrewd, implacable little steel radamanthus that, once the coins are delivered up to it, lifts and balances each in turn for the fraction of an instant, finds it wanting or sufficient, and dismisses it to the right or left with rigorous justice. When I am told of micrometers and thermopiles and tasimeters which deal physically with the invisible, the impalpable and the unimaginable, of cunning wires and wheels and pointing needles which will register your and my quickness so as to exclude flattering opinion, of a machine for drawing the right conclusion which will doubtless by and by be improved into an automaton for finding true premises, if a microphone which detects the cadence of the fly's foot on the ceiling and may be expected presently to discriminate the noises of our various follies as they soliloquize or converse in our brains, my mind seeming too small for these things, I get a little out of it, like an unfortunate savage too suddenly brought face to face with civilization, and I exclaim, Am I already in the shadow of the coming race? And will the creatures who are to transcend and finally supersede us be steely organisms, giving out the effluvia of the laboratory, and performing with infallible exactness more than everything that we have ever performed with a slovenly approximativeness and self-defeating inaccuracy? But, says Trost, treating me with cautious mildness on hearing me vent this raving notion, you forget that these wonder-workers are the slaves of our race, need our attendance and regulation, obey the mandates of our consciousness, and are only deaf and dumb bringers of reports which we decipher and make use of. They are simply extensions of the human organism, so to speak, limbs immeasurably more powerful, ever more subtle fingertips, ever more mastery over the invisibly great and the invisibly small. Each new machine needs a new appliance of human skill to construct it, new devices to feed it with material, and often keener-edged faculties to note its registrations or performances. How then can machines supersede us? They depend upon us. When we cease, they cease. I'm not so sure of that, said I, getting back into my mind and becoming rather willful in consequence. If, as I have heard you contend, machines, as they are more and more perfected, will require less and less of tendance, how do I know that they may not be ultimately made to carry, or may not in themselves evolve, conditions of self-supply, self-repair, and reproduction, and not only do all the mighty and subtle work, possibly on this planet, better than we could do it, but, with the immense advantage of banishing from the Earth's atmosphere screaming consciousnesses, 
which in our comparatively clumsy race make an intolerable noise and fuss to each other about every petty ant-like performance looking at all work only as it were to spring a rattle here or blow a trumpet there with a ridiculous sense of being effective i for my part cannot see any reason why a sufficiently penetrating thinker who can see his way through a thousand years or so should not conceive a parliament of machines in which the manners were excellent and the motions infallible in logic one honourable instrument a remote descendant of the voltaic family might discharge a powerful current entirely without animosity on an honourable instrument opposite of more upstart origin but belonging to the ancient edge tool race which we already at sheffield see paring thick iron as if it were mellow cheese by thus unerringly directed discharge operating on movements corresponding to what we call estimates and by necessary mechanical consequence on movements corresponding to what we call the funds which with a vain analogy we sometimes speak of as sensitive for every machine would be perfectly educated that is to say would have the suitable molecular adjustments which would act not the less infallibly for being free from that fussy accompaniment of that consciousness to which our prejudice gives a supreme governing rank when in truth it is an idle parasite on the grand sequence of things nothing of the sort returned trost getting angry and judging it kind to treat me with some severity what you have heard me say is that our race will and must act as a nervous centre to the utmost development of mechanical processes the subtly refined powers of machines will react in producing more subtly refined thinking processes which will occupy the minds set free from grosser labour say for example that all the scavengers work of london were to be done so far as human attention is concerned by the occasional pressure of a brass button as in the ringing of an electric bell you will then have a multitude of brains set free for the exquisite enjoyment of dealing with the exact sequence and high speculations supplied and prompted by the delicate machines which yield a response to the fixed stars and give readings of the spiral vortices fundamentally concerned in the production of epic poems or great judicial harangues so far from mankind being thrown out of work according to your notion concluded trost with a peculiar nasal note of scorn if it were not for your incurable dilettantism in science as it is in other things if you had once understood the action of any delicate machine you would perceive that the sequences it carries throughout the realm of phenomena would require many generations perhaps eons of understandings considerably stronger than yours to exhaust the store of work it lays open precisely said i with a meekness which i felt was praiseworthy it is the feebleness of my capacity bringing me nearer than you to the human average that perhaps enables me to imagine certain results better than you can doubtless the very fishes of our rivers gullible as they look and slow as they are to be rightly convinced in another order of facts form fewer false expectations about each other than we should form about them if we were in a position of somewhat fuller intercourse with their species for even as it is we have continually to be surprised that they do not rise to our carefully selected bait take me then as a sort of reflective and experienced carp but do not estimate the justice of my ideas by my facial expression pooh says trost we are on very intimate terms naturally i persisted it is less easy to you than to me to imagine our race transcended and superseded since the more energy a being is possessed of the harder it must be for him to conceive his own death but i from the point of view of a reflective carp can easily imagine myself and my congeners dispensed with in the frame of things and giving away not only to a superior but a vastly different kind of entity what i would ask you is to show me why since each new invention casts new light along the pathway of discovery and each new combination or structure brings into play more conditions than its inventor foresaw 
there should not at length be a machine of such high mechanical and chemical powers that it would find and assimilate the material to supply its own waste, and then, by a further evolution of internal molecular movements, reproduce itself by some process of fission or budding. This last stage having been reached either by man's contrivance or as an unforeseen result, one sees that the process of natural selection must drive men altogether out of the field, for they will long before have begun to sink into the miserable condition of those unhappy characters in fable, who, having demons or jinns at their beck, and being obliged to supply them with work, found too much of everything done in too short a time. What demons so potent as molecular movements, none the less tremendously potent for not carrying the futile cargo of a consciousness screeching irrelevantly, like a foul tide head downmost to the saddle of a swift horseman. Under such uncomfortable circumstances our race will have diminished with the diminishing call on their energies, and by the time that the self-repairing and reproducing machines arise, all but a few of the rare inventors, calculators, and speculators will have become pale, pulpy, and cretinous from fatty or other degeneration, and behold around them a scanty hydrocephalous offspring, as to the breed of the ingenious and intellectual, their nervous systems will at last have been overwrought in following the molecular revelations of the immensely more powerful unconscious race, and they will naturally, as the less energetic combinations of movements, subside like the flame of a candle in the sunlight. Thus the feebler race, whose corporeal adjustments happened to be accompanied with a maniacal consciousness which imagined itself moving its mover, will have vanished, as all less adapted existences do before the fittest, i.e. the existence composed of the most persistent groups of movements and the most capable of incorporating new groups in harmonious relation, who, if our consciousness is, as I have been given to understand, a mere stumbling of our organisms on their way to unconscious perfection, who shall say that those fittest existences will not be found along the track of what we call inorganic combinations, which will carry on the most elaborate processes as mutely and painlessly as we are now told that the minerals are metamorphosing themselves continually in the dark laboratory of the earth's crust? Thus the planet may be filled with beings who will be blind and deaf as the inmost rock, yet will execute changes as delicate and complicated as those of human language and all the intricate web of what we call its effects, without sensitive impression, without sensitive impulse. There may be, let us say, mute orations, mute rhapsodies, mute discussions, and no consciousness there even to enjoy the silence. Mm, absurd, grumbled Trost. The supposition is logical, I said. It is well argued from the premises. Whose premises? cried Trost, turning on me with some fierceness. You don't mean to call them mine, I hope. Heaven forbid. They seem to be flying about in the air with other germs and have found a sort of needus among my melancholy fancies. Nobody really holds them. They bear the same relation to real belief as walking on the head for a show does to running away from an explosion or walking fast to catch the train. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf Chapter 18 The Modern Hep, Hep, Hep to discern likeness amidst diversity, it is well known, does not require so fine a mental edge as the discerning of diversity amidst general sameness. The primary rough classification depends on the prominent resemblances of things. The progress is towards finer and finer discrimination according to minute differences. Yet even at this stage of European culture, one's attention is continually drawn to the prevalence of that grosser mental sloth which makes people dull to the most ordinary prompting of comparison, the bringing things together because of their likeness. 
the same motives, the same ideas, the same practices, are alternately admired and abhorred, lauded and denounced, according to their association with superficial differences, historical or actually social. Even learned writers treating of great subjects often show an attitude of mind not greatly superior in its logic to that of the frivolous fine lady who is indignant at the frivolity of her maid. To take only the subject of the Jews, it would be difficult to find a form of bad reasoning about them which has not been heard in conversation or been admitted to the dignity of print. But the neglect of resemblances is a common property of dullness which unites all the various points of view, the prejudiced, the puerile, the spiteful, and the abysmally ignorant. That the preservation of national memories is an element and a means of national greatness, that their revival is a sign of reviving nationality, that every heroic defender, every patriotic restorer has been inspired by such memories and has made them his watchword, that even such a corporate existence as that of a Roman legion or an English regiment has been made valorous by memorial standards, these are the glorious commonplaces of historic teaching at our public schools and universities, being happily ingrained in Greek and Latin classics. And every speaker would feel his point safe if he were to praise Byron's devotion to a cause made glorious by ideal identification with the past. Hardly so if he were to insist that the Greeks were not to be helped further because their history shows that they were anciently unsurpassed in treachery and lying and that many modern Greeks are highly disreputable characters, while others are disposed to grasp too large a share of our commerce. The same with Italy. The pathos of his country's lot pierced the youthful soul of Mazzini, because, like Dante's, his blood was fraught with the kinship of Italian greatness, his imagination filled with a majestic past that wrought itself into a majestic future. Half a century ago, what was Italy? an idling place for dilettantism or of itinerant motiveless wealth, a territory parceled out for papal sustenance, dynastic convenience, and the profit of an alien government? What were the Italians? No people, no voice in European councils, no massive power in European affairs, a race thought of in English and French society as chiefly adapted to the operatic stage or to serve as models for painters, disposed to smile gratefully at the reception of halfpence, and by the more historical remembered to be rather polite than truthful, in all probability a combination of Machiavelli, Rubini, and Massoniello. Thanks chiefly to the divine gift of a memory which inspires the moments with a past, a present, and a future, and gives the sense of corporate existence that raises man above the otherwise more respectable and innocent brute, all that, or most of it, has changed. Again, one of our living historians finds just sympathy in his vigorous insistence on our true ancestry on our being the strongly marked heritors in language and genius of those old English seamen who, beholding a rich country with a most convenient seaboard, came doubtless with a sense of divine warrant and settled themselves on this or that side of fertilizing streams, gradually conquering more and more of the pleasant land from the natives who knew nothing of Odin, and finally making unusually clean work in ridding themselves of those poor occupants. Let us, he virtually says, let us know who were our forefathers, who it was that won the soil for us and brought the good seed of those institutions through which we should not arrogantly but gratefully feel ourselves distinguished among the nations as possessors of long-inherited freedom. Let us not keep up an ignorant kind of naming which disguises our true affinities of blood and language but let us see thoroughly what sort of notions and traditions our forefathers had, and what sort of song inspired them. Let the poetic fragments which breathe forth their fierce bravery in battle and their trust in fierce gods who helped them be treasured with affectionate reverence. 
These seafaring, invading, self-asserting men were the English of old time, and were our fathers who did rough work by which we are profiting. They had virtues which incorporated themselves in wholesome usages to which we trace our own political blessings. Let us know and acknowledge our common relationship to them, and be thankful that, over and above the affections and duties which spring to us from our manhood, we have the closer and more constantly guiding duties which belong to us as Englishmen. To this view of our nationality, most persons who have feeling and understanding enough to be conscious of the connection between the patriotic affection and every other affection which lifts us above emigrating rats and free-loving baboons will be disposed to say, Amen. True, we are not indebted to those ancestors for our religion. We are rather proud of having got that illumination from elsewhere. The men who planted our nation were not Christians, though they began their work centuries after Christ and they had a decided objection to Christianity when it was first proposed to them. They were not monotheists, and their religion was the reverse of spiritual. But since we have been fortunate enough to keep the island home that they won for us, and have been on the whole a prosperous people, rather continuing the plan of invading and spoiling other lands than being forced to beg for shelter in them, Nobody has reproached us because our fathers 1,300 years ago worshipped Odin, massacred Britons, and were with difficulty persuaded to accept Christianity, knowing nothing of Hebrew history and the reasons why Christ should be received as the Savior of mankind. The Red Indians, not liking us when we settled among them, might have been willing to fling such facts in our faces but they were too ignorant, and besides, their opinions did not signify because we were able, if we liked, to exterminate them. The Hindus also have doubtless had their rancors against us and still entertain enough ill will to make unfavorable remarks on our character, especially as to our historic rapacity and arrogant notions of our own superiority. They perhaps do not admire the usual English profile, and they are not converted to our way of feeding. But though we were a small number of an alien race profiting by the territory and produce of these prejudiced people, they were unable to turn us out. At least, when they tried, we showed them their mistake. We do not call ourselves a dispersed and a punished people. We are a colonizing people, and it is we who have punished others. Still, the historian guides us rightly in urging us to dwell on the virtues of our ancestors with emulation, and to cherish our sense of a common descent as a bond of obligation. The eminence, the nobleness of a people, depends on its capacity of being stirred by memories and of striving for what we call spiritual ends, ends which consist not in immediate material possession, but in the satisfaction of a great feeling that animates the collective body as with one soul. A people having the seed of worthiness must feel an answering thrill when it is adjured by the deaths of its heroes who died to preserve its national existence, when it is reminded of its small beginnings and gradual growth through past labors and struggles, such as are still demanded of it in order that the freedom and well-being thus inherited may be transmitted unimpaired to children and children's children, when an appeal against the permission of injustice is made to great precedence in its history and to be the better genius breathing in its institutions. It is this living force of sentiment in common which makes a national consciousness Nations so moved will resist conquest with the very breasts of their women, will pay their millions and their blood to abolish slavery, will share privation in famine and all calamity, will produce poets to sing some great story of a man, and thinkers whose theories will bear the test of action. An individual man to be harmoniously great must belong to a nation of this order, if not in actual existence, yet existing in the past, in memory, as a departed, invisible, beloved ideal, once a reality and perhaps to be restored. A common humanity is not yet enough to feed the rich blood of various activity which makes a complete man. 
The time has not come for cosmopolitanism to be highly virtuous, any more than for communism to suffice for social energy. I am not bound to feel for a Chinaman as I feel for my fellow countrymen. I am bound not to demoralize him with opium, not to compel him to my will by destroying or plundering the fruits of his labor on the alleged ground that he is not cosmopolitan enough, and not to insult him for his want of my tailoring and religion when he appears as a peaceable visitor on the London pavement. It is admirable in a Briton with a good purpose to learn Chinese, but it would not be a proof of fine intellect in him to taste Chinese poetry in the original more than he tastes the poetry of his own tongue. Affection, intelligence, duty radiate from a centre, and nature has decided that for us English folk that centre can be neither China nor Peru. Most of us feel this unreflectingly, for the affectation of undervaluing everything native and being too fine for one's own country belongs only to a few minds of no dangerous leverage. What is wanting is that we should recognize a corresponding attachment to nationality as legitimate in every other people, and understand that its absence is a privation of the greatest good. For, to repeat, not only the nobleness of a nation depends on the presence of this national consciousness, but also the nobleness of each individual citizen our dignity and rectitude are proportional to our sense of relationship with something great, admirable, pregnant with high possibilities, worthy of sacrifice, a continual inspiration to self-repression, and disciplined by the presentation of aims larger and more attractive to our generous part than the securing of personal ease or prosperity. And a people possessing this good should surely feel not only a ready sympathy with the efforts of those who, having lost the good, strive to regain it, but a profound pity for any degradation resulting from its loss, nay, something more than pity when happier nationalities have made victims of the unfortunate, whose memories nevertheless are the very fountain to which the persecutors trace their most vaunted blessings. These notions are familiar, few will deny them in the abstract and many are found loudly asserting them in relation to this or that other particular cause. But here, as elsewhere, in the ardent application of ideas, there is a notable lack of simple comparison or sensibility to resemblance. The European world has long been used to consider the Jews as altogether exceptional, and it has followed naturally enough that they have been accepted from the rules of justice and mercy, which are based on human likeness. But to consider a people whose ideas have determined the religion of half the world, and that the more cultivated half, and who made the most eminent struggle against the power of Rome as a purely exceptional race, is a demoralizing offense against rational knowledge, a stultifying inconsistency in historical interpretation. Every nation of forcible character, i.e. of strongly marked characteristics, is so far exceptional the distinctive note of each bird species is in this sense exceptional, but the necessary ground of such distinction is a deeper likeness. The superlatives particularly in the Jews admitted, our affinity with them is only the more apparent when the elements of their peculiarity are discerned. From whatever point of view the writings of the Old Testament may be regarded, the picture they present of a national development is of high interest and specialty. Nor can the historic momentousness be much affected by any varieties of theory as to the relation they bear to the New Testament or to the rise and constitution of Christianity. Whether we accept the canonical Hebrew books as a revelation or simply as part of an ancient literature makes no difference to the fact that we find there the strongly characterized portraiture of a people educated from an earlier or later period to a sense of separateness unique in its intensity, a people taught by many concurrent influences to identify faithfulness to its national traditions with the highest social and religious blessings. Our two scanty sources of Jewish history, from the return under Ezra to the beginning of the desperate resistance against Rome, show us the heroic and triumphant struggle of the Maccabees which rescued the religion and independence of the nation from the corrupting sway of the Syrian Greeks, 
adding to the glorious sum of its memorials and stimulating continuous efforts of a more peaceful sort to maintain and develop that national life which the heroes had fought and died for by internal measures of legal administration and public teaching thenceforth the virtuous elements of the jewish life were engaged as they had been with varying aspect during the long and changeful prophetic period and the restoration under ezra on the side of preserving the specific national character against a demoralizing fusion with that of foreigners whose religion and ritual were idolatrous and often obscene there was always a foreign party reviling the national party as narrow and sometimes manifesting their own breadth in extensive views of advancement or profit to themselves by flattery of a foreign power such internal conflict naturally tightened the bands of conservatism which needed to be strong if it were to rescue the sacred ark the vital spirit of a small nation the smallest of the nations whose territory lay on the highway between three continents and when the dread and hatred of foreign sway had condensed itself into dread and hatred of the romans many conservatives became zealots whose chief mark was that they advocated resistance to the death against the submergence of their nationality much might be said on this point towards distinguishing the desperate struggle against a conquest which is regarded as degradation and corruption from rash hopeless insurrection against an established native government and for my part if that were of any consequence i share the spirit of the zealots i take the spectacle of the jewish people defying the roman edict and preferring death by starvation or the sword to the introduction of caligula's deified statue into their temple as a sublime type of steadfastness but all that need be noticed here is the continuity of that national education by outward and inward circumstance which created in the jews a feeling of race a sense of corporate existence unique in its intensity but not before the dispersion unique in essential qualities there is more likeness than contrast between the way we english got our island and the way the israelites got canaan we have not been noted for forming a low estimate of ourselves in comparison with foreigners or for admitting that our institutions are equalled by those of any other people under the sun many of us have thought that our sea-wall is a specially divine arrangement to make and keep us a nation of sea kings after the manner of our forefathers secure against invasion and able to invade other lands when we need them though they may lie on the other side of the ocean again it has been held that we have a peculiar destiny as a protestant people not only able to bruise the head of an idolatrous christianity in the midst of us but fitted as possessors of the most truth the most tonnage to carry our purer religion over the world and convert mankind to our way of thinking the puritans asserting their liberty to restrain tyrants found the hebrew history closely symbolical of their feelings and purpose and it can hardly be correct to cast the blame of their less laudable doings on the writings they invoked since their opponents made use of the same writings for different ends finding there a strong warrant for the divine right of kings and the denunciation of those who like korah dathan and abiram took on themselves the office of the priesthood which belonged of right solely to aaron and his sons or in other words to men ordained by the english bishops we must rather refer the passionate use of the hebrew writings to affinities of disposition between our race and the jewish is it true that the arrogance of a jew was so immeasurably beyond that of a calvinist and the just sympathy and admiration which we give to the ancestors who resisted the oppressive acts of our native kings and by resisting rescued or won for us the best part of our civil and religious liberties is it justly to be withheld from those brave and steadfast men of jewish race who fought and died or strove by wise administration to resist the oppression and corrupting influences of foreign tyrants 
and by resting rescued the nationality which was the very hearth of our own religion at any rate seeing that the jews were more specifically than any other nation educated into a sense of their supreme moral value the chief matter of surprise is that any other nation is found to rival them in this form of self-confidence more exceptional less like the course of our own history has been their dispersion and their subsistence as a separate people through ages in which for the most part they were regarded and treated very much as beasts hunted for the sake of their skins or of a valuable secretion peculiar to their species the jews showed a talent for accumulating what was an object of more immediate desire to christians than animal oils or well-furred skins and their cupidity and avarice were found at once particularly hateful and particularly useful hateful when seen as a reason for punishing them by mulcting or robbery useful when this retributive process could be substantially carried forward kings and emperors naturally were more alive to the usefulness of subjects who could gather and yield money but edicts issued to protect the king's jews equally with the king's game from being harassed and hunted by the commonality were only slight mitigations to the deplorable lot of a race held to be under the divine curse and had little force after the crusades began as the slaveholders in the united states counted the curse on ham as justification of negro slavery so the curse on the jews was counted a justification for hindering them from pursuing agriculture and handicrafts for marking them out as execrable figures by a peculiar dress for torturing them to make them part with their gains or for more gratuitously spitting at them and pelting them for taking it as certain that they killed and ate babies poisoned the wells and took pains to spread the plague for putting it to them whether they would be baptized or burned and not failing to burn and massacre them when they were obstinate but also for suspecting them of disliking the baptism when they got it and then burning them in punishment of their insincerity finally for hounding them by tens or tens of thousands from the homes where they had found shelter for centuries and inflicting on them the horrors of a new exile and new dispersion all this to avenge the saviour of mankind or else to compel these stiff-necked people to acknowledge a master whose servants showed such beneficent effects of his teaching with a people so treated one of two issues was possible either from being a feebler nature than their persecutors and caring more for ease than for the sentiments and ideas which constituted their distinctive character they would everywhere give way to pressure and get rapidly merged into populations around them or being endowed with uncommon tenacity physical and mental feeling peculiarly the ties of inheritance both in blood and faith remembering national glories trusting in their recovery a boring apostasy able to bear all things and hope all things with the consciousness of being steadfast to spiritual obligations the kernel of their number would harden into an inflexibility more and more insured by motive and habit they would cherish all differences that marked them off from their hated oppressors all memories that consoled them with a sense of virtual though unrecognized superiority and the separateness which was made their badge of ignominy would be their inward pride their source of fortifying defiance doubtless such a people would get confirmed in vices an oppressive government and a persecuting religion while breeding vices in those who hold power are well known to breed answering vices in those who are powerless and suffering what more direct plan than the course presented by european history could have been pursued in order to give the jews a spirit of bitter isolation of scorn for the wolfish hypocrisy that made victims of them of triumph in prospering at the expense of the blunderers who stoned them away from the open paths of industry or on the other hand to encourage in the less defiant a lying conformity 
a pretense of conversion for the sake of the social advantage attached to baptism, an outward renunciation of their hereditary ties with the lack of real love toward the society and creed which extracted this galling tribute, or again, in the most unhappy specimens of the race, to rear transcendent examples of odious vice, reckless instruments of rich men with bad propensities, unscrupulous grinders of the alien people who want to grind them. No wonder the Jews have their vices. No wonder if it were proved, which it has not hitherto appeared to be, that some of them have a bad preeminence in evil, an unrivaled superfluity of naughtiness. It would be more plausible to make a wonder of the virtues which have prospered among them under the shadow of oppression. But instead of dwelling on these, or treating as admitted what any hardy or ignorant person may deny, let us found simply on the loud assertions of the hostile. The Jews, it is said, resisted the expansion of their own religion into Christianity. They were in the habit of spitting on the cross. They have held the name of Christ to be anathema. Who taught them that? The men who made Christianity a curse to them? The men who made the name of Christ a symbol for the spirit of vengeance? And, what is worse, made the execution of the vengeance a pretext for satisfying their own savageness, greed, and envy? the men who sanctioned with the name of Christ a barbaric and blundering copy of pagan fatalism in taking the words, His blood be upon us and on our children, as divinely appointed verbal warrant for wreaking cruelty from generation to generation on the people from whose sacred writings Christ drew his teaching. Strange retrogression in the professors of an expanded religion, boasting an illumination beyond the spiritual doctrine of Hebrew prophets, for Hebrew prophets proclaimed a God who demanded mercy rather than sacrifices. The Christians also believed that God delighted not in the blood of rams and bulls, but they apparently conceived him as requiring for his satisfaction the sighs and groans, the blood and roasted flesh of men whose forefathers had misunderstood the metaphorical character of prophecies which spoke of spiritual preeminence under the figure of a material kingdom. Was this the method by which Christ desired his title to the messiahship to be commended to the hearts and understandings of the nation in which he was born? Many of his sayings bear the stamp of that patriotism which places fellow countrymen in the inner circle of affection and duty. And did the words, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, refer only to the centurion and his band, a tacit exception being made of every Hebrew there present from the mercy of the Father and the compassion of the Son? Nay, more of every Hebrew yet to come who remained unconverted after hearing of his claim to the messiahship not from his own lips or those of his native apostles, but from the lips of alien men whom cross, creed, and baptism had left cruel, rapacious, and debauched. It is more reverent to Christ to believe that he must have approved the Jewish martyrs who deliberately chose to be burned or massacred rather than be guilty of a blaspheming lie, more than he approved the rabble of crusaders who robbed and murdered them in his name. But these remonstrances seem to have no direct application to personages who take up the attitude of philosophic thinkers and discriminating critics, professedly accepting Christianity from a rational point of view as a vehicle of the highest religious and moral truth, and condemning the Jews on the ground that their obstinate adherents of an outworn creed maintain themselves in moral alienation from the people with whom they share citizenship and are destitute of real interest in the welfare of the community and state with which they are thus identified. These anti-Judaic advocates usually belong to a party which has felt itself glorified in winning for Jews as well as dissenters and Catholics the full privileges of citizenship laying open to them every path to distinction. At one time, the voice of this party urged that differences of creed were made dangerous only by the denial of citizenship, that you must make a man a citizen before he could feel like one. 
At present, apparently, this confidence has been succeeded by a sense of mistake. There is a regret that no limiting clauses were insisted on, such as would have hindered the Jews from coming too far and in too large proportion along those opened pathways. And the Romanians are thought to have shown an enviable wisdom in giving them as little chance as possible. But then the reflection occurring that some of the most objectionable Jews are baptized Christians, it is obvious that such clauses would have been insufficient, and the doctrine that you can turn a Jew into a good Christian is emphatically retracted. But clearly these liberal gentlemen, too late enlightened by disagreeable events, must yield the palm of wise foresight to those who argued against them long ago. And it is a striking spectacle to witness minds so panting for advancement in some directions that they are ready to force it on an unwilling society. In this instance despairingly recurring to medieval types of thinking, insisting that the Jews are made viciously cosmopolitan by holding the world's money bag, that for them all national interests are resolved into the algebra of loans, that they have suffered an inward degradation, stamping them as morally inferior, and serve them right, since they rejected Christianity, all which is mirrored in an analogy, namely that of the Irish, also a servile race who have rejected Protestantism, though it has been repeatedly urged on them by fire and sword and penal laws, and whose place in the moral scale may be judged by our own advancement, where the clause, no Irish need apply, parallels the sentence which for many polite persons sums up the questions of Judaism, I never did like the Jews. It is certainly worth considering whether an expatriated, denationalized race used for ages to live among antipathetic populations, must not inevitably lack some conditions of nobleness. If they drop that separateness which has made their approach, they may be in danger of lapsing into a cosmopolitan indifference equivalent to cynicism, and of missing that inward identification with the nationality immediately around them which might make some amends for their inherited privation. No dispassionate observer can deny this danger. Why, our own countrymen, who take to living abroad without purpose or function to keep up their sense of fellowship in the affairs of their own land, are rarely good specimens of moral healthiness, still the consciousness of having a native country, the birthplace of common memories and habits of mind, existing like a parental hearth, quitted but beloved, the dignity of being included in a people which has a part in the comity of nations and the growing federation of the world, that sense of special belonging which is the root of human virtues, both public and private. All these spiritual links may preserve migratory Englishmen from the worst consequences of their voluntary dispersion. Unquestionably the Jews, having been more than any other race exposed to the adverse moral influences of alienism, must, both in individuals and in groups, have suffered some corresponding moral degradation. But, in fact, they have escaped with less of abjectness and less of hard hostility toward the nations whose hand has been turned against them than could have happened in the case of a people who had neither their adhesion to a separate religion founded on historic memories, nor their characteristic family affectionateness. Tortured, flogged, spit upon, the corpus vile, on which rage or wantonness vented themselves with impunity, their name flung at them as an opprobrium by superstition, hatred, and contempt. They have remained proud of their origins. Does anyone call this an evil pride? Perhaps he belongs to that order of man who, while he has a democratic dislike to dukes and earls, wants to make believe that his father was an idle gentleman, when in fact he was an honorable artisan, or who would feel flattered to be taken for other than an Englishman. It is possible to be too arrogant about our blood or our calling, but that arrogance is virtue compared with such mean pretense. The pride which identifies us with a great historic body 
is a humanizing, elevating habit of mind, inspiring sacrifices of individual comfort, gain, or other selfish ambition for the sake of this ideal whole, and no man swayed by such a sentiment can become completely abject. Let a Jew of Smyrna, where a whip is carried by passengers ready to flog off the two officious specimens of his race, can still be proud to say, I am a Jew, is surely a fact to awaken admiration in a mind capable of understanding what we may call the ideal forces in human history. And again, a varied, impartial observation of the Jews in different countries tends to the impression that they have a predominant kindness, which must have been deeply ingrained in the constitution of their race to have outlasted the ages of persecution and oppression. The concentration of their joys in domestic life has kept up in them the capacity of tenderness, the pity for the fatherless and the widow, the care for the woman and the little ones, blent intimately with their religion as a well of mercy that cannot long or widely be pent up by exclusiveness. And the kindliness of the Jew overflows the line of division between him and the Gentile. On the whole, one of the most remarkable phenomena in the history of this scattered people, made for ages a scorn and a hissing, is that, after being subjected to this process, which might have been expected to be in every sense deteriorating and vitiating, they have come out of it, in any estimate which allows for numerical proportion, rivaling the nations of all European countries in healthiness and beauty of physique, in practical ability, in scientific and artistic aptitude, and in some forms of ethical value. A significant indication of their natural rank is seen in the fact that at this moment the leader of the Liberal Party in Germany is a Jew, the leader of the Republican Party in France is a Jew, and the head of the Conservative Ministry in England is a Jew. And here it is that we find the ground for the obvious jealousy which is now stimulating the revived expression of old antipathies. The Jews, it is felt, have a dangerous tendency to get the uppermost places, not only in commerce, but in political life. Their monetary hold on governments is tending to perpetuate in leading Jews a spirit of universal alienism, euphemistically called cosmopolitanism, even where the West has given them a full share in civil and political rights. A people with oriental sunlight in their blood, yet capable of being everywhere acclimatized, they have a force and toughness which enables them to carry off the best prizes, and their wealth is likely to put half the seats in Parliament at their disposal. There is truth in these views of Jewish social and political relations, but it is rather too late for liberal pleaders to urge them in a merely vituperative sense. Do they propose as a remedy for the impending danger of our healthier national influences getting overridden by Jewish predominance, that we should repeal our emancipatory laws? Not all the Germanic immigrants who have been settling among us for generations and are still pouring in to settle are Jews, but thoroughly Teutonic and more or less Christian craftsmen, mechanicians or skilled and erudite functionaries, and the Semitic Christians who swarm among us are dangerously like their unconverted brethren in complexion, persistence, and wealth. Then there are the Greeks who, by the help of Phoenician blood or otherwise, are objectionably strong in the city. Some judges think that the Scotch are more numerous and prosperous here in the South than is quite for the good of us Southerners, and the early inconvenience felt under the Stuarts of being quartered upon by a hungry, hard-working people with a distinctive accent and form of religion and higher cheekbones than English taste requires has not yet been quite neutralized. As for the Irish... It is felt in high quarters that we have always been too lenient toward them. At least if they had been harried a little more, there might not have been so many of them on the English press, of which they divide the power with the Scotch, thus driving many Englishmen to honest and ineloquent labor. So far shall we be carried, 
if we go in search of devices to hinder people of other blood than our own from getting the advantage of dwelling among us. Let it be admitted that it is a calamity to the English, as to any other great historic people, to undergo a premature fusion with immigrants of alien blood, that its distinctive national characteristics should be in danger of obliteration by the predominating quality of foreign settlers. I not only admit this, I am ready to unite in groaning over the threatened danger. To one who loves his native language, who would delight to keep our rich and harmonious English undefiled by foreign accent, foreign intonation, and those foreign tinctures of verbal meaning which tend to confuse all writing and discourse. It is an affliction as harassing as the climate that on our stage, in our studios, at our public and private gatherings, in our offices, warehouses, and workshops, we must expect to hear our beloved English with its words clipped, its vowels stretched and twisted, its phrases of acquiescence and politeness, of cordiality, dissidence, or argument, delivered always in the wrong tones, like ill-rendered melodies, marred beyond recognition, that there should be a general ambition to speak every language except our mother English, which persons of style are not ashamed of corrupting with slang, false foreign equivalents, and a pronunciation that crushes out all color from the vowels and jams them between jostling consonants. An ancient Greek might not like to be resuscitated for the sake of hearing Homer read in our universities. Still, he would at least find more instructive marvels and other developments to be witnessed at those institutions. But a modern Englishman is invited from his after-dinner repose to hear Shakespeare delivered under circumstances which offer no other novelty than some novelty of false intonation, some new distribution of strong emphasis on prepositions, some new misconception of a familiar idiom. Well, it is our inertness that is in fault, our carelessness of excellence, our willing ignorance of the treasures that lie in our national heritage, while we are agape after what is foreign, though it may be only a vile imitation of what is native. This marring of our speech, however, is a minor evil, compared with what must follow from the predominance of wealth-acquiring immigrants, whose appreciation of our political and social life must often be as approximative or fatally erroneous as their delivery of our language. But take the worst issues. What can we do to hinder them? Are we to adopt the exclusiveness for which we have punished the Chinese? Are we to tear the glorious flag of hospitality which has made our freedom the worldwide blessing of the oppressed? It is not agreeable to find foreign accents and stumbling locutions passing from the piquant exception to the general rule of discourse, but to urge on that account that we should spike away the peaceful foreigner would be a view of international relations not in the long run favorable to the interests of our fellow countrymen. For we are at least equal to the races we call obtrusive in the disposition to settle wherever money is to be made and cheaply idle living to be found. In meeting the national evils which are brought upon us by the onward course of the world, there is often no more immediate hope or resource than that of striving after fuller national excellence, which must consist in the molding of more excellent individual natives. The tendency of things is toward the quicker or slower fusion of races. It is impossible to arrest this tendency. All we can do is to moderate its course so as to hinder it from degrading the moral status of societies by a too rapid effacement of those national traditions and customs which are the language of the national genius, the deep suckers of healthy sentiment. Such moderating and guidance of inevitable movement is worthy of all effort. And it is in this sense that the modern insistence on the idea of nationalities has value that any people at once distinct and coherent enough to form a state should be held in subjection by an alien, antipathetic government has been becoming more and more a ground of sympathetic indignation, 
and in virtue of this at least one great state has been added to European councils. Nobody now complains of the result in this high case, though far-sighted persons see the need to limit analogy by discrimination. We have to consider who are the stifled people and who the stiflers before we can be sure of our ground. The only point in this connection on which Englishmen are agreed is that England itself shall not be subject to foreign rule. The fiery resolve to resist invasion, though with an improvised array of pitchforks, is felt to be virtuous and to be worthy of a historic people. Why? Because there is a national life in our veins, because there is something specifically English which we feel to be supremely worth striving for, worth dying for, rather than living to renounce it. Because we too have our share, perhaps a principal share, in that spirit of separateness which has not yet done its work in the education of mankind, which has created the varying genius of nations, and, like the muses, is the offspring of memory. Here, as everywhere else, the human task seems to be the discerning and adjustment of opposite claims. But the end can hardly be achieved by urging contradictory reproaches, and instead of laboring after discernment as a preliminary to intervention, letting our zeal burst forth according to a capricious selection, first determined accidentally and afterwards justified by personal predilection. Not only John Gilpin and his wife, or Edwin and Angelina, seem to be of opinion that their preference or dislike of Russians, Serbians, or Greeks, consequent perhaps on hotel adventures, has something to do with the merits of the Eastern question. Even in a higher range of intellect and enthusiasm, we find a distribution of sympathy or pity for sufferers of different blood or votaries of different religions, strangely unaccountable on any other ground than a fortuitous direction of study or trivial circumstances of travel. With some, even admirable persons, one is never quite sure of any particular being included in a general term. A provincial physician, it is said, once ordering a lady patient not to eat salad, asked pleadingly by the affectionate husband whether she might eat lettuce or cresses or radishes. The physician had too rashly believed in the comprehensiveness of the word salad, just as we, if not enlightened by experience, might believe in the all-embracing breadth of sympathy with the injured and oppressed. What mind can exhaust the grounds of exception which lie in each particular case? There is understood to be a particular odor from the Negro body, and we know that some persons, too rationalistic to feel bound by the curse on ham, used to hint very strongly that this odor determined the question on the side of Negro slavery. And this is the usual level of thinking in polite society concerning the Jews. Apart from theological purposes, it seems to be held surprising that anybody should take an interest in the history of a people whose literature has furnished all our devotional language. And if any reference is made to their past or future destinies, some hearer is sure to state as a relevant fact, which may assist our judgment, that she, for her part, is not fond of them, having known a Mr. Jacobson, who was very unpleasant, or that he, for his part, thinks meanly of them as a race, though on inquiry you find that he is so little acquainted with their characteristics that he is astonished to learn how many persons whom he had blindly admired and applauded are Jews to the backbone. Again, men who consider themselves in the very van of modern advancement, knowing history and the latest philosophies of history, indicate their contemptuous surprise that anyone should entertain the destiny of the Jews as a worthy subject by referring to Moloch and their own agreement with the theory that the religion of Jehovah was merely a transformed Moloch worship, while in the same breath they are glorifying civilization as a transformed tribal existence of which some lineaments are traceable in grim marriage custom of the native Australians. Are the erudite persons prepared to insist 
that the name Father should no longer have any sanctity for us, because in their view of likelihood, our Aryan ancestors were mere improvers on a state of things in which nobody knew his own father. For less theoretic men, ambitious to be regarded as practical politicians, the value of the Hebrew race has been measured by their unfavorable opinion of a prime minister who is a Jew by lineage. But it is possible to form a very ugly opinion as to the scrupulousness of Walpole or of Chatham, and in any case I think Englishmen would refuse to accept the character and doings of those 18th century statesmen as the standard of value for the English people and the part they have to play in the fortunes of mankind. If we are to consider the future of the Jews at all, it seems reasonable to take as a preliminary question, are they destined to complete fusion with the people among whom they are dispersed, losing every remnant of a distinctive consciousness as Jews, or are there in the breadth and intensity with which the feeling of separateness or what we may call the organized memory of a national consciousness actually exists in the worldwide Jewish communities, the seven millions scattered from east to west, and again, are there in the political relations of the world the conditions present or approaching for the restoration of a Jewish state planted on the old ground as a center of national feeling, a source of dignifying protection, a special channel for special energies which may contribute some added form of national genius and an added voice in the councils of the world. They are among us everywhere. It is useless to say we are not fond of them. Perhaps we are not fond of proletaries and their tendency to form unions, but the world is not therefore to be rid of them. If we wish to free ourselves from the inconveniences that we have to complain of, whether in proletaries or in Jews, our best course is to encourage all means of improving these neighbors, who elbow us in a thickening crowd, and of sending their incommodious energies into beneficial channels. Why are we so eager for the dignity of certain populations, of whom perhaps we have never seen a single specimen, and who, whose history, legend, or literature we have been contentedly ignorant for ages, while we sneer at the notion of a renovated national dignity for the Jews, whose way of thinking and whose very verbal forms are on our lips in our every prayer which we end with an Amen. Some of us consider this question dismissed when they have said that the wealthiest Jews have no desire to forsake their European palaces and go to live in Jerusalem. But in a return from exile and the restoration of a people, the question is not whether certain rich men will choose to remain behind, but whether there will be found worthy men who will choose to lead the return. Plenty of prosperous Jews remained in Babylon when Ezra marshaled his band of 40,000 and began a new glorious epoch in the history of his race, making the preparation for that epoch in the history of the world, which has been held glorious enough to be dated from forevermore. The hinge of possibility is simply the existence of an adequate community of feeling, as well as widespread need in the Jewish race, and the hope that among its finer specimens there may arise some men of instruction and ardent public spirit, some new Ezra's, some modern Maccabees, who will know how to use all favoring outward conditions, how to triumph by heroic example over the indifference of their fellows and the scorn of their foes and will steadfastly set their faces toward making their people once more one among the nations. Formerly, evangelical orthodoxy was prone to dwell on the fulfillment of prophecy in the restoration of the Jews. Such interpretation of the prophets is less in vogue now. The dominant mode is to insist on a Christianity that disowns its origin, that is not a substantial growth having a genealogy, but is a vaporous reflex of modern notions. The Christ of Matthew had the heart of a Jew. Go ye first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The apostle of the Gentiles had the heart of a Jew. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, 
who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Modern apostles extolling Christianity are found using a different tone. They prefer the medieval cry translated into modern phrase. But the medieval cry, too, was in substance very ancient, more ancient than the days of Augustus. Pagans in successive ages said, These people are unlike us and refuse to be made like us. Let us punish them. The Jews were steadfast in their separateness, and through that separateness Christianity was born. A modern book on liberty has maintained that from the freedom of individual men to persist in idiosyncrasies, the world may be enriched. Why should we not apply this argument to the idiosyncrasy of a nation and pause in our haste to hoot it down? There is still a great function for the steadfastness of the Jew. Not that he should shut out the utmost illumination which knowledge can throw on his national history, but that he should cherish the store of inheritance which that history has left him. Every Jew should be conscious that he is one of a multitude possessing common objects of piety in the immortal achievements and immortal sorrows of ancestors who have transmitted to them a physical and mental type strong enough, eminent enough in faculties, pregnant enough with peculiar promise, to constitute a new beneficent individuality among the nations, and by refuting the traditions of scorn, nobly avenge the wrongs done to their fathers. There is a sense in which the worthy child of a nation that has brought forth illustrious prophets, high and unique among the poets of the world, is bound by their visions. Is bound? Yes, for the effective bond of human action is feeling, and the worthy child of a people owning the triple name of Hebrew, Israelite, and Jew feels his kinship with the glories and the sorrows, the degradation and the possible renovation of his national family. Will anyone teach the nullification of this feeling and call his doctrine a philosophy? He will teach a blinding superstition, the superstition that a theory of human well-being can be constructed in disregard of the influences which have made us human. End of chapter 18 End of the Impressions of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot This LibriVox recording by Josh Middledorf in the public domain.